Please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, and if you stand, I'll be reading verses 29 through 39. So we continue to look at Jesus' ongoing provision for his stubborn people. Verse 29. Departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up on the mountain, he was sitting there. And large crowds came to him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others, and they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restore, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them. And he started giving them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and he came to the region of Magadan. Please be seated. When I thought God was hard, I found it easy to sin. But when I found God so kind, so good, so overflowing with compassion, I smote my breast to think that I could ever have rebelled against one who loved me so and sought my good. It's a quote from Charles Spurgeon, and I think he there it just encapsulates well when we understand what it means that God is compassionate and loving and gracious, it, it inspires and it strengthens our obedience. Holiness is necessary in the Christian life, but it really, it's a response to the goodness of our God. Holiness is for our best. Holiness is for our good. And our God is so gracious and compassionate to draw us to himself that we might look like him, that he might receive glory, and that we might fully be satisfied. Now, we know that God has sufficient resources to provide for us. However, I'm not sure that we are always convinced that his compassion towards us is such that he loves to provide for us and that he is, in fact, constantly looking for ways to bless us and encourage us. These are not accidental. He doesn't just put the world into place and, and we accidentally are blessed. He is constantly looking for ways to pour out his blessings upon us as his children. Now, I think sometimes we, we don't believe that because we know our own sinful, selfish tendencies, and we realize we don't deserve it. So we're like, how can God be like that? And, and so perhaps we're, we're not sure that he really is. I, I think sometimes we are not aware of God's compassion as we should be because we don't feel like he's provided what we needed or wanted. So in the past, we feel like, well, maybe the Lord, right at the right time, he didn't give me what I wanted. At least that's the way it seems to us. And Perhaps sometimes we don't think he's compassionate because we don't view trials and difficulties as coming from his good and providing hand just as much as abundance and ease. He brings both of those. And both of those are from his good hand and both of those are part of his compassion, both his, his, the, the, the ease of circumstance as well as the difficulty of circumstance. Well, our passage this morning will remind us that we need not and indeed must not doubt the heart of God to make provision for his people because of his perfect example that he provides for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus ever and always reveals the compassionate heart of God. So what we'll see this morning is that Jesus is the compassionate king whose kind, loving provision is always more than sufficient for our need, but whose provision is always required in our need. Jesus is the compassionate king whose kind, loving provision is always more than sufficient for our need, but whose provision is always required in our need. The Christian life continually requires Christ's compassionate, complete provision. Now in our text in Matthew 15, as we come to the end of that chapter, we've seen, seen the king rebuke the religious leaders. Then we saw him expose the heart of depravity of every man. Then he leaves the borders of Israel and he encounters a woman of great faith. He gives her a little theology lesson in salvation history, and then he heals her daughter and moves his way back towards the nation of Israel. As he comes back into Israel, remember, he goes down on the east side of the lake of uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, really continuing to minister in, in, in largely Gentile lands. A, a lot of these that he's ministering to, to here would most likely still be Gentiles. It is within the traditional uh, range or borders of Israel. The, the tribes, uh, some of the, several of the tribes had their 
uh, inheritance on that side of the, of the lake. But nonetheless, many Gentiles here. And so he continues to really allow the, the overflow of the crumbs that go to the nation of Israel to provide abundantly for the Gentiles even here. And he ministers to the crowd. We saw that he went up on the mountain and he sat down, which wasn't because he was tired, but because that is the teaching stance of a rabbi. So he goes up and he sits on the mountain so that he might teach them. While the crowd comes to him, yes, they, they hear his teaching, right? And they are amazed, continually amazed by his teaching. But what we see Matthew focusing on is that they bring all of their sick. Again, Jesus has entered back into the, really the, the realm of Israel. And again, there are these massive crowds that come to him. In this case, maybe ten to 15,000 people, 4,000 men and then the women and children, bringing with them all of their sick. And, and they lay them, what we said last week, it was like they, they cast the, the sick before them because they're, they're desperate in their need. No one else can do this. Nowhere else can they go to receive this kind of physical healing. And they are there to receive the physical healing. That's what they want. We see in, in John chapter 6, which we'll reference again this morning later on, as, as Jesus was healing the 5,000, he really, he, he speaks to them afterwards, and he says, you're just here to receive the, the physical blessings and benefits that I give to you. That, that's the only reason you're here. But you need to understand that you have to partake of me spiritually. That's what you really need, and that's not what the crowd was there for. They loved the physical provision, but they were not yet ready, most of them, to bend the knee to Jesus as their Savior, Messiah, and Lord. And so we saw, though, that he heals in his grace, in his compassion, in his kindness that he extends to all men, truly God has a love for all of mankind, a compassion that he pours out upon them. He gives them life and breath and rain and crops and healing here with the Son of God coming, the King being there. He healed them all, right? And he healed them for three days. They come and they come and they come. And, and we saw the picture in verse 31. The crowd is marveling as the mute are speaking, the crippled are restored. They're, they're, they're showing off their new limbs or, their, or, or their, their reformed limbs, which now work. The lame are walking. They're casting aside their crutches and leaping up off their beds. And the blind are seeing for the first time, some of them, and again, some of them, and, and, and seeing loved ones and seeing the, the world around them. And it's just an unbelievable picture, really a preview of the kingdom. What it will be like when Jesus comes to rule and to reign forever? Well, we get a little picture, a little preview. And we talked about the fact that Jesus heals here in ways that no one has ever done. The apostles are the only ones who come close to that. And even they doesn't seem like in any individual ministry healed in such an extensive fashion as Jesus did. And really that, that, that time, that the entire time that, that Jesus and the apostles are ministering is to, be, is to authenticate the word of God, to, to lay the foundation for the church. And nothing like this has happened in the history of the world since then and will not again until our Savior returns. He heals to demonstrate his deity. He heals to give a preview of the kingdom. The king is here and this is what it will be like when he returns. He heals to authenticate his message. He heals out of kindness and compassion. There's no certain expectation we discussed last week of this kind of healing today because there are no longer any apostles and the king is not physically present. Jesus amazes the crowd with this, as we saw, but they are not amazed at his nature as Messiah. They are not amazed and in awe of him, so they bend the knee to him as Savior and Lord. They glorify the God of Israel, and that's as far as they go. We know that God has provided this. That we cannot deny that these things come from the hand of God, but they do not give Jesus the worship and honor that he deserves. Well, now let's continue on to see how Jesus responds to them. As again, they glorify God. They're thankful for what they've received from God. And, and they love having all this physical provision. Well, how does Jesus respond to this? So let's continue on as we see him in all of his grace and power, having compassion on really this unbelieving multitude, continuing to care for them and ultimately even to feed them to provide for their physical needs. So let's look at verse 32 as Jesus feeds the multitude. It says, and Jesus called his disciples. So while all this is going on, this incredible uh, scene of, of really kingdom, uh, kingdom work as, as all these people are being healed, delighting and glorifying in their healing and the physical provision they receive, Jesus called his disciples to him, verse 32, and he said, I feel compassion for the people. And, and now this is perhaps a bit surprising. Because they have remained with me now for three days and they have nothing to eat, and I do, not want them to send, I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. Now, we've before seen Jesus have compassion on the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd, understanding their spiritual need. He has compassion. We've seen him have compassion on them because they needed to be healed, the extremity of their physical need. But this strikes me, I, I guess maybe because I lack the compassion of Jesus, this strikes me as a bit mundane. He has compassion on them because he's afraid that if he sends them away, they're so hungry, they might fall over on the road. They might faint. It's like, I mean, come on. 
You can, you can get home. What's the big deal? You've been out here. It's like, it's like mom, you know, I'm afraid that my kids won't get home. They won't be able to make it back. And yet this is the heart of Jesus for these people who do not care for him. They do not love him. Yet he is so concerned for them that he's afraid that if he sends them away, they won't even be able to make it home. They'll just kind of pass out on the side of the road because they haven't had enough food to eat. So he's not only thinking of their spiritual need, not only thinking of their, their physical extremity, the needs that they have to be healed. He's, he's thinking on this incredibly, seemingly mundane level. Just, they haven't had enough food. They're not going to be able to make it home because some of them have to go a long way. They're not going to be able to make it back to the house. This is the compassion of Jesus. And always it stuns me because it's so much greater than mine in every way that he's caring about all of these people who do not truly care about him even to the extent of the, of the most mundane of physical needs. Yes, their food, I mean, they're not going to die on the way home. I mean, they're, not, they're probably not going to, I mean, three days without food is not going to kill you. But yet, they, they might trip, they might fall, they might not have enough strength. I mean, it's a very, again, a very normal picture and, and a, a kind of compassion that doesn't spring to my heart probably nearly often enough. So the compassion of Jesus, he, he calls the disciples to himself. He expresses this kind of compassion. And again, this is a very strong word. It isn't like kind of a passing concern. You know, yeah, I've been thinking about it and, and they might not make it home. So, so you know, we should provide for them. No, it, it, he feels this from the very depths of his being. It's the same word, the same expression used when he saw them like sheep without a shepherd, that they were gonna go to eternal hell. He had that kind of compassion. And then he has a, a compassion on them again for, for their need to be, to be physically healed. And it's the same kind, the same heart of compassion that flows from Jesus for this very normal physical need. They just are really, really hungry. And they're gonna have a hard time even walking home. This compassion is deep. It is strong. It is abiding. It's one who has deep and total sympathy for, for the object of, of, that, of that compassion. So they've been here three days. That all of this has been going on, this, the teaching and the healing. And so they ran out of food. They have nothing to eat. Again, they most likely brought something along with them, but weren't expecting necessarily to stay that long. And they might faint on the way home. They're not going to make it all the way because of this hunger that they have. Mark 8, 3, the sister passage to this says, if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way because some of them have come from a great distance. They came all this way because they were in desperate need of this healing. In Matthew 9, verse 36, again, we saw that compassion expressed when they were dispirited. Matthew 9, 36, they were dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew 14, 14, we saw the compassion. It says he felt compassion on them as he healed their sick. And here this compassion extends all the way to the, to, to the most mundane of their physical needs. And this is, the, this is the heart of God for us. Remember, Jesus expresses this. It isn't like this is some, some unique thing. This is the only time that Jesus had this kind of compassion and the rest of the time he doesn't. Or, or that God occasionally expresses his compassion to his people in this way. We get, you, know, you only get the little snapshots of it. Uh, consider Matthew 5.44. When Jesus talks about God's love for the world, essentially, really, when he, he talks about what, the kind of love that we ought to have for one another, he uses this example of God. He, he says to the people in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And then he says this, for he causes, that is God, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Every day, God is pouring out his compassion upon a sinful, sick, and evil world. And he is doing it not by accident, not because he somehow just put the, the laws of nature into place and they kind of naturally produce these things. It is an overflow of his heart of love and compassion for his created beings every day, every moment of every day. As people breathe air, as they receive the benefit and blessings of the earth in which we live, it is not accidental. It comes from the compassionate heart of God upon both the evil and the good. How unlike God are we? For us to have compassion moment by moment uh, upon those who both bother us and, 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 and anger us as well as upon those who are easier to love, it, it's hard enough for us to do that every once in a while. It's hard enough for us to think about those things and, and act in compassion towards those who are closest to us. God does this as the overflow of his character every second of history as long as it lasts. In fact, we'll do so into eternity, most particularly upon his people in heaven, pouring out upon them the blessings of kindness and active work of kindness towards them. This is an incredible thought that God loves in this way. And Jesus exemplifies this for us. 
He sympathizes with us in every way, and he sympathizes with the world as a whole. This is what it means when it said, for God so loved the world. He has a kindness and compassion that are extended to everyone. They do not all benefit of his special saving love, but they all benefit from his kind, gracious, and compassionate love, every person who's ever been born. There will be no one who ever stands before God and says, you did not love me. He will say, you sucked air for as long as you were on this earth. I provided for you to have the gas exchange in your lungs so that you could continue to breathe. I loved you, and I proved it every second you were alive, and you rejected me. So we, can, we cannot, we must not, we will never say that God does not love the world. And he has proved to them that love every day they wake up and they walk out of it, they get out of their beds and they walk out into the world. He has said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And they've rejected him, those who do not know him. And, and this is what Israel was doing as he heals them and heals them and heals them and feeds them as we will see and provides for them in every way and dies for them saying, I love you. The vast majority of them rejected him. And he did not stop loving. And I wonder, just, just as we consider this compassion of Jesus on this very physical level, which really surpasses even probably the best of us as parents. On my, on my good days, when I look at my children and they're in physical need, I'm very compassionate. On my bad days, I'm like, just deal with it. Okay, you know, just, just move on, do what you need to do. I'm busy, we got stuff to do, here's a little medicine, you know, move on. I might be the only one that does that, but I think maybe not. But, but, but how different the Lord Jesus is and, and, how, and how we need to carefully consider continually his goodness and his kindness so that we might be like him, so that we might reflect this to a world that desperately needs to see this kind of compassion. We are to be as our heavenly father. Our world is so full of anger. It is so full of hatred. We must be so careful that we as Christians never mimic this, even against the evils that are, are increasing against us, and they will continue to increase. Should the Lord not make some kind of radical change over these next years, they will continue. And yet our compassion is to continue and our love is to continue because this is a reflection of our Heavenly Father. Hebrews 4, 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Every kind, physical, spiritual, every kind, he can sympathize. One who's been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Now I would say this. Looking at Jesus is incredible incredible compassion, even for our physical needs. And remember that physical needs only extend to this physical world, and so they're only a problem while we're living here. Imagine, really, I, I think the greater nature of, of Christ's compassion on those who are going to eternal hell, his recognition of our spiritual needs. I think you'd have to say that, kind of arguing from the lesser to the greater, if he has such a great compassion, just when people are hungry and might faint on the way home, imagine the heart that he feels for those who are on the way to eternal hell. How much greater even is that compassion? and a desire to see them saved, and how much greater should our compassion be as well. Romans 2, 4 is clear, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And might it be that we as believers, that, that our kindness would lead others to repentance. I, I know we deal with sin. I, I know we stand up against evil. All of those things are right and good. But God certainly is, certainly not, you know, we're not more holy than he, and we have the right to have greater indignation than he. Certainly he is indignant against the wicked and indignant against sin, but he continues to have a kindness and a love which draws people to him. He says, look, I'm kind to you. I love you. Even to the level of you, if you're going to walk home and you don't have enough food, you might fall over on the way. You might trip and, and scrape your knee. To, to that extent, and his riches, the riches of his kindness and tolerance lead others to repentance. So how might we practically apply this? Well, how about doing some of the things that we're doing as a church and, and supporting the church to do these things, like, like $12,000 a year to send down to Haiti to care for orphans that are there. It's not only their physical needs we're providing for, but we don't want the orphans stumbling on the street and falling over and being harmed and, and hurt any more than Jesus does. We don't desire, it's not like, well, you know, we're, we're more spiritual than that. We, we don't care about their physical needs, but man, we want them to get saved. We do want them to get saved. I do think the extension is the greater care and concern is, of course, for the spiritual need that lasts into eternity. But it's not that we overlook the harm to the orphan, the harm to the afflicted, the harm to others around us. We don't overlook it. We seek to do what we can in light of the mission we're given as the church to make provision for those things. We support the Chilawi Baptist Center, $2,500 a year. It probably could be more. 
because they deal with the poor in our area in ways that we cannot, in wise ways, where they, where they, they bring them in and they, they make sure that they're not just using the system and they do everything they can to, to make real provision, extending hundreds of hours to see that the people in our community are actually provided for. And yes, they bring them the gospel, but this kindness is part of what leads them to repentance as they see us reach out and extend our lives in this way. We're so afraid, I think, maybe of, of, the, of, of tipping over into the social gospel. That is, the, the only gospel is really that we fix the earth and, and, and fix people's lives. We're maybe so afraid of that that we won't do that at all. Well, that's, that's not what, Jesus wasn't afraid of that. He met their spiritual needs. He met their physical needs. He, he met every kind of need. And we can only do so much, and we have to make sure our priorities r- r- remain around the, the, the truths of the gospel being presented. But it doesn't mean that we do nothing. And we support the Pregnancy Resource Center continually so that those who come who have the, the physical, they've got, they've got to have a baby. Well, you can't, you can't abort that child. Well, how about some provision? Well, it's their fault that they're in that way. Well, you know what? It's your fault that you're a sinner too. And God was certainly gracious to you to yank you out of the, out of the situations that you were in and provide you for, with all of this tremendous blessing. Are we not going to extend that to someone else? Well, they got into that position. Well, you know what? We'll help them get out because that's what God does. The world has gotten into this evil, horrible position. We all come into the world tainted, broken with sin, and God pulls us out. So we do, and we give pictures of that as we can physically. That's, that's part of what the church does. Because when you support the church, that's part of what you're doing. We, we presented that to you a bit on, on a couple Sunday nights ago. All those in, in the jail ministry coming out. Well, uh, well, I mean, they're there because they sinned. And yet they're coming out of the jail needing tremendous amounts of help and encouragement and strengthening. And who are we to say, well, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We'll preach the gospel at you and turn you loose onto the streets. That's not a tremendous benefit. And there's only so much we can do, but I feel like we ought to do more. And it seems to me that as we see the pattern of Jesus here in Matthew, that it ought to drive us to do more. And these things take resources and time and effort and energy. I mean, we have to stop our play, a lot of it, some of it at least. We're so busy playing, so busy doing things that, that, we, that we forget that these things are necessary. Doing things that are fine to do, that are not prohibited to do, and yet are perhaps not all that we could do in providing for these kinds of needs. Maybe you'd support some ministries individually. There's some good ministries out there, things that we don't directly do as a church, something like Compassion International, who in Jesus' name makes provision for children through local churches. In fact, it got removed from the nation of India because they were so overtly Christian. It's kind of a testimony to the, to the support organizations that were able to remain in India because they gave no testimony to Jesus. So there are those that do that. Are you thinking about that? Are you considering that? I would say always the, the bulk and majority of your support going through the local church to provide these things, but I think certainly appropriate to find some additional ways, perhaps in things that we don't or on, are, are unable to do, that you might be able to provide for as well. And how about on a very, very fundamental level that we pray for the sick and the hurting? Now, I know that, that last week I, I belabored the point, and purposely I did, that, that this, this, this miraculous healing, these things that are being claimed today, is not going on today. That, that it's parlor tricks by those who are claiming the power of Jesus and the apostles and doing nothing that even closely resembles it. Nothing's even close to it. And that's right and good. That emphasis is good because those ministries are destroying people. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea that somehow God is not powerful, that somehow he does not work in ways that are far beyond anything we could ever imagine, and that he does not desire for us to pray that he might do work in others, even physically, that would be a blessing and benefit to them. I hope you didn't get that idea. That's why we do expository preaching. We take a week at a time. I can't preach everything one week. I hammered that very hard because it's deadly. But also I want to be sure that we know and understand that we pray for one another, that we lift each other up when we're sick. Why do we do that? I don't think our expectation is. In fact, I'm convinced that it isn't the same kind of healing, the same magnitude of healing done during the time of Jesus and the apostles because they're not here. But we do continue to do it. Turn to James chapter 5. So a very natural outflow of a compassion, this compassion that Jesus has, even to the point of being compassionate on those who are just hungry, flows out when we pray for our own sick. And I think this is the New Testament pattern that we find in James chapter 5 that that really reflects the way that that we pray for and and seek to minister to, through God's miraculous work, those who are sick in our own body. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? That would be external difficulties coming upon them as a result of persecution and other things. Are you suffering? Then he must pray. 
So you cry out to God on your suffering. You say, God, give me the strength to make it through this. If you would alleviate this, please might I not have to face the, the difficulties of this external suffering. Certainly there are our brothers and sisters around the world who are praying such things. Might we not be being killed? Please might not people break into our homes and rape and murder our children. Please, God, might you do that? And he, by his miraculous hand, does. As he sees fit, when he sees fit, according to his will. And so you pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. That's another way of praying. We pray to the Lord when we sing. I hope you are. I was not just words. Oh, this is song. No, this is prayer to the Lord. Praises to God. Or you're praying back to him along with music. It's designed by God to have a very powerful effect. That's what it's for. We're praying. Are you, were you joyful this morning? Do you have anything in your life to be joyful for? Then your praises should have, and as I could hear you, seem to be rising up to the Lord in great joy because every one of you sitting here this morning has something to be joyful about. You're breathing air. You're sitting here. You're part of this church. You, you have family members around you. You're wearing clothes. Very few of you are hungry unless you just chose not to eat this morning. What would we not have to be thankful for? Most importantly, you're on your way to heaven, the vast majority of you. You will spend eternity with the God of the universe. What do you not have to sing about? That does frustrate me at times. And I can't look inside your hearts, and I, I don't. And, and I try not to look at your faces and be distracted by that when it's just like, you're like, Inform your face of the joy that's supposed to be in here. Somebody tell your face that, that God is good. And I think many of you, and you, probably if you look at me, you might say the same thing. I'm, so, I'm not jumping up and down and, and you know, giving external manifestations. But I tell you, there's rarely a time where we do not stand here and rejoice to just be here, to be able to lift up my praises to the Lord because of his goodness. And, and you ought to be the same. And I assume you are. Please understand that as I look around, and I do that purposely because I'm worshiping with you, it's not my own private worship experience, me and the Lord and nobody else here and I can do whatever. And It's not that. I look at you to see if you're joining me and, I, and maybe you're looking at me to see if I'm joining you. That's great and I don't judge your face, but help me out. <laughs> and then help others out who walk in the door. And they're like, who are these people singing to? It looks like they just can't wait to get, no. For most of you, it's not true. Okay, but for some of you, it is. At least it looks that way. And maybe, and maybe, Maybe you walked in this morning with a heavy heart that I know nothing about. Maybe you walked in with difficulties and struggles that I could never imagine. And you're working through that as you worship. That's okay. You're allowed to do that. And as I said, I'm not judging you for what your face looks like. Because I don't know what happened in your life. But nonetheless, I assume and I hope that you're assuming along all together with us that we are, if, if he is, if he's cheerful, he's to sing praises. And I'm not... The rule here is I'm not supposed to preach cross-references, but I am doing that, so I need to be careful. Is anyone among you sick? Here's where I was really going. Then he must come. I'm not going to preach this one either because it's way too, it would take way too long. But just the, just the overview. Is anyone among you sick? What's he, what's he supposed to do? Sit at home and pout? No. You know, just kind of crumble in on himself and do nothing. Just go to the hospital and sneak into the hospital and not tell anybody. No. It says, anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church that are pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. This is really the New Testament pattern. I think here this is not every sickness that anyone has. I have a cold call for the elders. Probably not. It does seem there's some serious extremity here. Someone who is, has been sick for a while and, 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 and now calls out to the elders to come and pray for him. But he doesn't call for the healer. He doesn't call for Benny Hinn. He doesn't call for the apostle. He doesn't even call for the person with a gift of healing. He calls for the elders. The elders are not required to have a gift of healing. In the vast majority of times, and in our day and age, I wouldn't say they ever do. Why are they coming? Because they're mature men who love the Lord and they've got a lot of faith. And so they pray knowing that God can heal. Every elder who comes and stands over the bed of someone who is sick would be thinking, God can heal this person if he so desires. That, that's, that's what we would expect. That's what elders do. They should be able to pray in that way. So he calls for them. The, the oil, I don't really know how that works. I believe it's, I believe it's symbolic. That is simply a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit's presence and power how you would apply it. So we don't normally do that. I do think there, there's kind of to a, a bit of a cultural understanding of that. I'm not sure what that is, but I know how to pray. And it's not the oil that heals anyone. It's the prayer that does. It says the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. So we don't often bring oil. It wouldn't mean wrong with that, but what, usually we will come and pray for you. But then it extends this out. Oh, and by the way, it says if he's committed sins, so he'll be forgiven him. I think that's fascinating because I, I'm, I'm convinced. Well, let me read the next verses. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another. What's with all the confession here? Because he, he then, when he broadens out the, the picture, 
beyond just the elders. He then says, really, this is to be going on in the congregation. Again, not with wild faith healings, but in a congregation where we're then confessing our sins to one another. And I think that's if you sin against someone. You're not standing up, you're not walking into someone's home to sit down and have dinner and say, hey, let me tell you all my sins. They're like, don't please, let's not do that. That's going to spoil our dinner. But if you sinned against them, you walk into the house going, you know what, I've sinned against you. Would you please forgive me? And, and so we, we confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? So that you may be healed. I think there's an understanding in this passage where the weightiness of the promise, which seems strong that, if, if, that they will be healed, the prayer offered in faith, seems to be related directly to this forgiveness of sin. The idea being this. Certainly it is true that not every sickness comes because of a direct sin. In fact, I say that's probably true for the majority of times. But when it does, and it does, 1 Corinthians 11 is very clear. Sickness does and can come because of personal sin. Almost always, by the way, it is in relationship to the body of Christ. Sins that we've committed against one another. God takes that particularly seriously because this is his body. Don't sin against it. And when you do, he comes for you. That's how it works. Guys, scripture says that. 1 Corinthians 11 is clear. Some of you are sick and some of you are dead because you're mishandling the Lord's Supper in its communal fashion, and you're harming the body of Christ as you come together. It's a serious, serious thing. But knowing that not all sin comes as a result of, or not all sickness comes as a result of personal sin, certainly some does. And I think the, the weightiness of the promise here is if the elders come, or you've confessed your sins to one another, clearly God forgives. The elders don't forgive. It's not personal confession to the elders, because notice again, it extends out to the congregation. We can confess our sins to one another when we sin against them. So that then it's a recognition of our need for forgiveness. God forgives. And I tell you this, that if you were sick because of sin and God forgave it, what's the implication? The sickness goes away. I think that's the strength of the promise. Certainly it is also true that if the sickness wasn't because of sin, that God often or certainly does heal it miraculously also. I would say that that's going to be less common than it was in the time of the apostles or when Christ was here because the foundation of the church is not being laid. I don't think it is always our expectation that every time the elders go and pray that he will, the person will be healed. I would say this, though. Again, if it's because of sin, and that sin is confessed and worked through and dealt with, I think there's a very strong implication here that that kind of sickness is, is healed, is done, if it was related to sin. Now, there's so much more there, and, and, and as much to be said, uh, there's a lot of, uh, some, some small group of people, John MacArthur included, who don't think that speaks of praying and healing at all, that it's more of a physical thing. I, I disagree with it. I think that speaks of our praying for people who are, who are physically sick and God can and does miraculously heal them, particularly when it's related to their sin that was forgiven because they confessed it. And, and I think that's an ongoing work. But you will notice that there is nothing like the wild and crazy stuff that goes on today. Nothing like that in James chapter 5. I think this is the ongoing pattern for the church. God does miraculously heal. He does heal according to the prayers of godly elders and of righteous men in the congregation. And I think that extends to women as well because he says, look, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He says, the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much, miraculous things. God certainly can and does do that. Not to the extent, I believe, very clearly to, that he did during the time when he was upon earth and the time of the apostles. But he does and can and will. And the expectation is that we would pray for one another that God's will would be done forgiving them of sin bringing healing. So a couple thoughts here. This is elder and congregation in the private context of the home, not even within the church gather. We don't bring them before the church and have a big prayer service. But the elders showed up at their house. You're confessing your sins to one another personally and individually, and then God is bringing healing as a result of that confessed sin and the forgiveness that he provides. What an amazing thing. No show, no band, no, 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 no big production God's people being healed miraculously as he desires within his congregation because people pray and they have faith and they confess their sins and they press on in holiness because that's the true miracles we talked about last week. It is a miracle when God heals physically. I think there's a, a far greater miracle when you love your spouse like you're supposed to, when you care for your children, when you forgive people as you should. It's the harder work. Jesus said that's the harder work. Looks like it's easier to forgive someone of their physical weakness because that's obvious to us, but it isn't. The harder work is forgiveness of sin. And, and, and that's the holiness that God would have for us. That's the true, uh, ultimately the true power that we live out amongst each other. This is not a general bringing of any and all sick, lame, blind in a particular town. That happened when Jesus was here. It happened when apostles were here, but now in the church. It's not go call everyone in the town to come and the elders will heal them. Are you in the church? Are you part of that local body? And that's the work that's, that's confined within individual local bodies. We're not to go out. We're not going out and healing the whole town. 
we are working and seeking and praying for those within our body. A major part of God's provision for us today as well that I want to remind you of are doctors and medicine, and we use those also. It's no less a work of God when the minds that he has enabled to think put together medicines that enable to, to bring healing, and God allows those medicines to work within an individual's body. Who do you think does that? You think magically that medicines do that? In, in essence, as it were, all by themselves, but when it's God who's holding together the very molecules of that medicine and enabling it to work in someone's life? I mean, God is working in all of those things, and so we need to remember that all today. But I hope that helps you so that you understand that certainly God does and can heal miraculously. It's not our expectation that it looks anything like it looked like for Jesus and the apostles, and yet we continue to pray, and within God's will, he continues to, to do as he will do to bring about the care of his people. And that's the kind of healing that we see today. And it's a joy, and it's a privilege, but it's nothing like the circuses and, and the harmfulness that goes on in the name of these things in many places. Well, let's now turn to the disciples of Jesus. So that's the compassion of Jesus as he calls his disciples to himself. Now let's look at his disciples. So, now, so he tells them, he brought them to himself, and back in Matthew chapter 15, he asks them another question. Uh, he says, uh, or really, he doesn't ask them a question, he makes a statement. They're, they're going to faint on the way, verse 32. His disciples said to him, where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? They're, they're responding to the question he didn't ask, which is, provide. How are we going to provide for this amount of people? They're going to faint on the way home. Again, almost like he's saying, hey, can you fix this? A little like he did before with the feeding of the 5,000. It's not said, everything else that he said to them, but they respond this way, where would we get so many loaves? Are, are, are you asking us to do this? It almost seems like you, you, know we can't, you know we can't do this. So we're out in the middle of a desolate place. We don't have the food. It's almost like, haven't we been through this before? So many loaves in a desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd. We just can't get this done. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, why didn't they just say, Jesus, you do this? Didn't we talk about that last time in the feeding of the 5,000? He, you know, he, he asks, you know, Philip, how are you going to get this done? And Philip goes, I, I don't know how we're going to get this done. And Jesus asked to test him because he already knew how he was going to do it. Well, I think it's true here. Jesus knows what he's going to do. He again kind of informs the disciples. The response is, I just, it's not much better. They're still like, I, we don't know. How is this going to happen? And, and we would wish, I think, that maybe they would say, Jesus, we know you've got this under control. Would, would you just take care of this? And we're thinking, oh, it's probably been a couple months, maybe four or five months since the last healing, maybe not quite that long. And they're thinking, I can't believe these disciples. You know, they didn't, they didn't figure out from the last time God made this incredible provision. Well, let's be a little careful with that. Were you frustrated this week by a lack of provision? Were you frustrated that God maybe didn't provide what you thought he ought to? Or, well, and how many times has God provided for you? And he's given us his son to provide for us spirit. So how quick are we to forget? Pretty quick. We have the spirit of God in ways that the disciples didn't even have. Let's be careful that we don't get too hard on them. And think, you know, as people say, well, this must be the same incident because it can't be a separate one because certainly the disciples wouldn't have forgotten by this short period of time. So they must be saying the same thing over. Ridiculous. Jesus himself refers to both incidents in Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 19. He says, when I broke the, f the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, see, two separate events. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, and he gives the numbers exactly as they are in the Gospels, of course, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven. And he was saying to them, don't you yet understand? Because even after that, they still didn't get it. But again, let's not be too hard on them. Our understanding of God's provision ebbs and flows on the basis of our comfort. We're like, oh, I forgot today that God makes provision. I forgot that I should have turned back to him and said, Lord, you do this. I can't do this. Because we understand that there is nothing ultimately that we can make provision for ourselves. Even your daily food isn't all about you. And the money that you receive from your work isn't all about you because God strengthened your limbs, gave you a mind, gave you breath, provided you a job, gave you a home, gave you a house, everything he gave to you. None of it is yours. You always cry out for his provision at every point because you are always needful of it. And you cry out understanding that he's always desirous of giving it to you and has, in fact, already done over and above anything we could ever have, have asked for. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. It says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. This is speaking spiritually here, but it's true in every way. But our adequacy is where? It's from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, 
not of the letter of the not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And in First Corinthians, he says to them, "What do you have that you did not receive? So why then do you boast as though you had not received it?" You guys, we are in desperate need of his provision, but he desperately longs to give that provision because of the depth of his compassion, even to the extent of, I'm afraid they're going to trip and fall down on the road on the way home. That's how much he cares for you. That's how much he's thinking about you. And if he was thinking about ungodly Israel in that way, how much more is he considering you, his children, those upon whom he has placed his special love, how much more is he considering you in that way? Well, let's, let's spend a moment here then looking at the provision that Jesus brings. They can't bring it Yes, they should have said, Jesus, you need to bring this. They, they didn't really say that, but he, he, he ignores them, and, and he just does it anyway. Right? So, so they say, we don't know what to do. And Jesus said, so let's talk about here three, the provision of Jesus. This is why his provision, because he, he does this. He says, how many loaves do you have? All right, you, you said you couldn't, couldn't go find more loaves. Let's just figure out the resources that you have. And I do think that's important. We always do take stock of what God has actually given to us. And we say, well, what do we have? What has God provided? We'll use, we'll start with that. And we'll always thank and ask the Lord and thank him for what he's given and then ask him for what we need. But it always begins with what you have. I think sometimes you forget to do that. Clearly, this is not enough. <laughs> they say seven loaves and a few small fish. I love it. The diminutive is put on there. It's almost as though they're emphasizing these fish are really small. You can't even cut them up. You're not going to be able to feed 4,000 people with these fish. They're teeny fish. When he, when, they use, when he uses the word again, that's the normal word for fish. They're emphasizing these are little small fish. Don't try this. You can't do it. <laughs> so, okay, seven loaves, a few. I mean, just in every way they're saying it's not possible. Just a couple of really teeny fish. See, I told you we couldn't do anything. It's not our fault. It's almost like they're making excuses for themselves. What are you going to do with, that teeny, with those teeny fish? But Jesus knows, and he knows what provision he has. And so he, he, doesn't, even, he doesn't even respond to that. Small fish, who cares? He just directs the people to sit on the ground. This is confident provision. So again, even as we look at the provision of God, we do so in wisdom, using the resources we have. Jesus does. He takes these very resources that are here, and then he uses those. He doesn't, he doesn't create right at, at, at the outset, you know, well, let's have 12 fish to start. No, he, he uses what's there. But, but then, this is, he's absolutely confident. He directs the people to sit down on the ground. It's not like, so, well, I'm not sure if this is going to work, so let's all, let's all stay standing up, and, and I'll see if I can, can generate some fish here. He's absolutely confident in what? His own ability to provide. Why wouldn't he be? But we should be equally as confident in his ability to provide. That we wake up each morning knowing that God will make full provision for us in all ways that he desires. And so we confidently go about his work, knowing that as long as he wants us alive, we'll be alive. As long as he wants us fed, we'll be fed. As long as he desires for us to be in, 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 the, in the circumstances that we are, he will leave us there. We are immortal, says George Woodfield, until our work is done. He will provide. And we can be absolutely confident because nothing can get in the way of his provision. Who can stop him from providing? The fish are too small. I mean, what is that, what is that to him? There's, there's enemies out there. Well, what is that to him? I mean, what keeps God from being able to provide? What stops his provision? Nothing. Absolute confidence. Then this is thankful provision. We know Jesus will do this. What he did when he fed the 5,000, he took the seven loaves and the fish. Now they're big fish. Okay. Now that's the normal word for fish. It's not, you know, these are, these are regular sized fish. It's okay. Right, so he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks. And I think this is often where we fail. We don't thank God for the resources that we do have. We don't thank him for what has actually been made. Well, it's not sufficient. It's not enough. God, why didn't you give more? No, we say, Lord, thank you so much for what I have. And sometimes we look at it and we go, it doesn't seem like it's enough. Not so much physically, but oftentimes spiritually, other things. Is that almost every one of you has full prov physical provision all the time. It isn't that you shouldn't pray for it. You should. And you should realize it's never your efforts that are sufficient to make that provision. Only God's are. But guys, we do look at things and we say, I don't think it's enough because we're not giving thanks. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God, this is yours. Thank you for what you've provided. My, my cars are enough. My house is enough. My clothing is enough. My food is enough. Thank you. The gifts that you've given to me spiritually are enough. Would you please, as it were, make them all that you want them to be. Multiply them as you, as you desire, but they're enough. I don't need more to begin with. Just please, but you use them to the fullest extent that only you can do, and he will. And we 
we give thanks. Every, nearly every time prayer is mentioned in Scripture, what comes right along with it? Thanksgiving. God hears the prayer of thanksgiving and petition. Yes, he hears your petitions, but he hears them through your thanks, even when that is through your tears, which it often is. I'm not saying this is some kind of party. Lord, I'm, 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 I'm dying of a disease. Would you please extend to me physical provision, perhaps for healing, if you would have that? If you choose not that, would you, would you extend to me the provision that I need to be to honor you and to please you? And would you support and encourage my family? And you do so. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have given me up to this point. But I wouldn't imagine that you were doing that without tears, without, without an understanding of the weightiness of what was going on. So that's the kind of thankfulness we're talking about oftentimes. It's not a, it's not a party thankfulness. It's not, a, it's not a, a Christian fake happiness thankfulness. It's a true, heartfelt, deeply rooted thankfulness to God for his incredible provision that he's made for us in Christ and in the world. And certainly that's Jesus' thanks. He is truly, sincerely, humbly, and joyfully saying, God, thank you for the seven fish. Father, thank you for the, for the seven loaves and the fish. Thank you. Well, it, it's a humble provision. And, and I, I think to some degree, in, in, in Jesus' case, as, as, you know, as, as a human, as he prays, it really fully God and fully man, but as he prays to his own father, would you make provision? Right? It seems like he's petitioning the father to do that, and, and then it, it is the father's power working through him, the spirit of God working through him, that then produces this food. So even he is being humble, but he's really also putting the disciples in this humble position. It says, he broke them, the loaves, and I think the implied that cut, cut the fish up, or maybe just took one fish, a whole fish, and handed it out. Who knows? And he started giving them to whom? To the disciples. Again, no show, no ban. No, look at me, great Jesus, and I will, prov- you know, I will, I will dispense to you this great provision. Everybody come to me. Uh, no, he hands them to his disciples very quietly, it seems. He just keeps handing them out and handing them out and handing them out. And they're coming and get them. They're, they're probably sitting in the 50s and 100s like they did before. The disciples are going around ministering to the people. Jesus gives no show, and the disciples here are put in the place of humbly serving these people who don't love their master, who who will will be the ones screaming, crucify him, and not too long. And the disciples know the nature of this people, and here they are having to really, in humility, come out and say, would you like some more fish? Would you like some bread? Can 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 I serve you? That is ever and always the nature of the servants of God, of the people of God. We're servants. We serve. We humbly give to others not on the basis of their worthiness, but simply because God has called us to humble ourselves. 1 Corinthians 4, 9, the Apostle Paul says, I thank, for I think, as he really really comes against, he provides a a defense against those who say apostles ought to be impressive and and teachers ought to be impressive. And and, and if people know Jesus, then they ought to be wealthy and rich and powerful. He says, I think God has exhibited us apostles least of all as men condemned to death because we become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake, but we are prudent in Christ. We are weak, yet you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we're hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed. We're roughly treated. We're homeless. We toil, working with our hands. We're reviled. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. That's a servant of God. We don't all necessarily, are not all in that same circumstance. And yet that's the heart of every servant of God. We're nothing but the dregs of the earth. We don't need to be impressive. We don't need to look good to you. We don't need to somehow appear to the world to have our cool clothes and our cool stuff and our, and our, our, our rich, hip ministries. We're the dregs of the earth, and we will pour our lives out to you until we die. And that's who we are. That's what it means to serve Jesus. This world knows nothing of that. And unfortunately, our evangelical culture knows even less. We are to serve in this way, just humbly handing out to the people. It's comprehensive provision. They all ate. Everyone, 15,000 people, every single person eats of those seven loaves and small fish or normal fish. It is satisfying. I love this. It's added. They all ate and were satisfied. The, the teenager sitting there with his dad, it's like, man, I need some more bread. Boom, there's John. Have some more bread. You know, got the big burly guy, you know, he's, 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 you know, he's the construction worker. And, and, and he's like, man, I'm still a little bit hungry. That, that was a little fish. To me, that was really small. Boom, there's Peter. Have some more fish. I mean, look, they were all satisfied. Whether God then made it satisfying the moment they ate it or whether he provided them more, I don't know. But when they were done, they were like, man, I'm full. I can barely get away from the table or the grass. Well, they, actually, it's interesting. They weren't sitting on the grass because it was a couple months later there was no grass, but it's another story. Satisfying provision, 
Does God satisfy us? He certainly does. Psalm 37, 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. The children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. This is how God provides. This is just a picture, this physical provision of the abundance of his provision for you. It's enough. The river of his delights is all that he's provided in Christ. It's abundant provision. They picked up seven large baskets. What's the meaning of, of seven? I have no idea. Right? He picked up 12 baskets before, probably, and, and they were small. The, the word for baskets here is different. In, in the first incidence, it, it was mostly Jewish crowd. They had the small Jewish baskets that they wrote down for lunch. They picked up 12. They're like, aha, symbolism for the one for the, each of the disciples. Well, what about this? Seven, we're going to cut the disciples in half and, you know, and add one. I, I don't know what the symbolism here. I, I, nobody tells us. So I'm just saying it's a bunch. The symbolism is abundance. There were seven loaves, seven baths. Who knows? I've got to be really careful. This typologically implies perfection. Well, tw- there was 12. Did that imply perfection? No, this typologically implies nothing. It means there was a lot extra left over. Seven, great. I don't think there's a meaning in the word seven, but I do think there's meaning in the word that there were extra baskets because when Jesus points to it later, he says, didn't you get it? 12 baskets, you know, first time there were 12 baskets, second time seven baskets. I provide over and above. Have you not figured this out? Who I am. By the way, the seven large baskets probably was equal to the 12 baskets before because the word basket here is for bigger basket that the Gentiles had. It's the same kind of basket that they lowered Paul down over the wall in Damascus. Not the little teeny Jewish lunch basket. He wouldn't fit. This is a bigger one. Right? Also indicates to us that he's probably in a, a Gentile area. And it says all those who were eight were 4,000 besides women and children. Total, complete, abundant provision. Well, the last on your outline, Jesus dismisses the multitude then. He releases the crowd. He departs for Magadon. It's, he's all done. He says, you're finished. He, he turns them loose. And I leave you with this. With the provision that God makes for us as believers, it is abundant, full, satisfying. It is in every way necessary for what we need. It is comprehensive. It is humble. It is thankful. It is confident. It is wise. And, and yet we find all of that embodied in who? In John Chapter 6, when Jesus makes application to the people's need, pointing past the bread and the physical provision, he says this, John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. In Christ, every spiritual blessing is to be had, the fullness and richness of provision. And if you've not run to Christ for his provision, you need to run today because the world has nothing for you. And if you have run to Christ, you need to continually experience and partake of that abundant provision as you press into his church, as you understand his word, as you cry out to him in prayer and to know the fullness of the provision that God has made for you in Jesus. You need nothing else. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this picture again of your power, of your compassion, of your provision. And I pray that we would live in light of those realities so that the world might see and might know as they watch us partake of of the rich goodness of your salvation, might it overflow out from us in our words and in our actions that they too would long to partake of the rich fulfillment that only you can provide. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.